This is a two-person game. Player one first moves and chooses D or U, and then player two observes D. If, if player one chooses U, the game is over, but if he chooses D, the game is going to move to the second player. The second player observes D and then chooses left or right. Um, and after the second player's choice, everything is perfectly observable, by the, by the way. This is a game with perfect information. Uh, perfect in the sense that everybody can, can observe all the previous moves. Remember, there's also what we call imperfect information games. That means sometimes some players cannot fully observe all the previous actions. Everybody can remember and observe his or her own action. All right, there's, so this is uh, perfect recall games. We will always talk about perfect recall games, but sometimes as a player one, I may not, rem I, I may not observe my opponent's previous actions. If this is the case, we call those games as imperfect information game. But this one is perfect information game and, and they are the easiest. So the first player moves after the second player again, and he chooses either head or tail or HT or U or D up or down, all right? And the game is over. So here, uh, the question is what are, or what is the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium strategy profiles and outcomes? And then I'm gonna ask, you know, uh, verify that some strategies are Nash equilibrium, but not subgame perfect Nash. If you want to find the Nash equilibrium of this game in, by the way, I'm going to talk about pure strategies only, all right? Unless I specifically say mixed strategies, all right? I will always mean pure strategy for the rest of this course, all right? So be, be careful about it. Uh, there's no need to confuse yourself with mixed strategies. Again, unless I ask for it. So here, uh, if you want to find the Nash equilibrium of this game, probably the easiest way is to write the normal form representation, right? The strategy for player one, player two, create the metrics, and then find the best responses and find the Nash equilibrium. That's probably the easiest way. But when the game is simple like this, it is easy. When the game is more complicated, meaning there are more players, for example, four or five players, or maybe, I don't know, more actions, well then, writing the normal form is not that you know, straightforward and simple. And so you also have to, you, you must understand how to verify a strategy profile being a Nash equilibrium or not. All right, this is also what we are gonna do. So first, let's find the, I'm gonna call it SPNE. Uh, some textbooks call it subgame perfect equilibrium, they ignore Nash. I don't know, for me it's SPNE, Subgame Perfect Nash Equilibrium. Well, if you want to find those strategy profiles or outcome, always your, your first reaction should be backward induction, use it. Okay, it's the simplest method you can uh, sort of employ. Well, what is the idea of backward induction? You basically remember at every uh, sort of part of the game, players are going to choose their actions optimally, even though they believe that they will never reach to those, you know, part of the game. So that means we, we start analyzing the game from the, the, from the last player. So here, the last player is player one, right? Meaning there's no one else after player one who, I mean, this decision note, there's no one else who is going to make a move. All right, same here. So here, this and this decision nodes are sort of the last decision nodes. Well, which one should I start? Should I start here or here? Doesn't matter, okay? Um, okay so here, what is the optimal action? Well, this is kind of a, a, a simple decision problem, right? Player one is gonna be choosing U or D. Whatever happened, happened. There's no way player one can change it. And so he's going to look forward, not backward, okay? So he's gonna say, well, what is going to, what is the best action I can choose here? Or what is the best outcome I can achieve here? Well, remember this is the first player and the first numbers correspond to the first player's payoff. So the best payoff he can achieve is three. And so he should be playing D, not U. All right, very simple. What about here? So again, if the game ever comes to this point, Right? There's nothing he can do about it. He can't change the, 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 the past, but he can definitely change the future. Should he play H or T? If he plays T, he's gonna get zero. If he plays H, he's gonna get one. Clearly one is higher than zero. So he should be going for H. So that means 
By the way, remember, all these games are common knowledge, meaning everybody observes this game, everybody observes, uh, you know, I mean, everybody sees this game as is. And everybody is rational, meaning they are choosing their actions and strategies just to maximize their own payoffs. And this is common knowledge. Everybody is aware of this fact. So that means player two should reason and say the following. Look, again, if the game ever comes to this point, uh, which means player one has played D, um, I can choose left or right. But the question is, which action or which strategy is sort of better for me? Well, kind of obvious. If I choose left, I know that player one is a rational guy. He will observe my choice and he will go for H, not for T, right? So therefore, I shouldn't really worry about this 0-0 zero, zero payoff because my opponent will not play T. So that means if I play L, I'm going to get 1. If I play, play R, I'm going to get 1 again, huh? because I know that my opponent is going to play D. So whatever action, a strategy I pick, left or right, my payoff will be 1. So therefore, what is the optimal strategy for me? Both left and right. So I'm going to put arrow to both of them, all right? indicating that both of them are actually optimal for player 2. Well, then finally, the first player, now he now uh, moves up or down or small u or d. And if he chooses u, he knows that he's going to end up with payoff 2. Good. When he chooses d, however, well, that depends what the second guy will do. He may play l, because remember, l is an optimal strategy for him, in which case uh, he will later play h and get 1. Or his opponent, too, may play R, in which case player 1 again move and choose D, in which case he's going to get 3. Hmm. So U is optimal only if my, I believe that my opponent, 2 guy, is going to play R. Otherwise, meaning if I believe that my opponent is going to choose L, I shouldn't play D because I'm going to end up 1, I should be playing U. So that, therefore, here, the optimal strategy for player one is conditional, all right? So the optimal for player one, optimal strategy or action here for player one is D, if, right, it is conditional, uh, if the second guy plays R, if two plays R. However, the optimal action for player one is U if two plays what? L. All right. So again, if he chooses L, he, I mean, player one knows that he's going to end up one and one, I mean, one payoff. And so for that reason, he chooses U and uh, not D. So basically, that's it. Uh, we sort of characterized uh, all the optimal strategies or actions. All we have to do is to bring them together. I don't know if you can see it now, but there are, because of this conditional uh, sort of statement, there are two subgame perfect Nash equilibrium strategy profiles. Meaning both of them are actually uh, optimal equilibrium. So one of them, the first one, uh, is the following. Player one plays uh, D, player two plays R, and then player one again plays H here, D here. So I'm going to write the strategies. If you cannot do it uh, as the way I'm doing, you may prefer to write down the strategy of player one and two separately first, and then bring them together. Okay, uh, let's do it. Uh, maybe later I'm going to skip this step. Uh, but, you know, uh, you probably better do this uh, until you get sort of the experience. Uh, th because this will always help you to visualize the strategy of the players. The second player strategy is very simple, left and right. Remember, don't forget the definition of strategy. It's a function maps every information set to an action available at that information set. Player one has one, two, three decision node or information set. So therefore, uh, it's a function means there's going to be three element in the range. So here, for example, uh, D 
H, U is one strategy, uh, D, uh, T, U is another strategy, uh, D, uh, H, D is another strategy, D, T, D is another strategy. And basically I can do all of those things with U. U, H, U. By the way, one of them is small U, the other one is big U. I hope you don't confuse U, T, U. Uh, U H D and U T D. All right, so he has basically uh, eight strategies. I'm sorry, Professor. Go ahead. Can, yes, we have to do with the three, or is can we write two also, like D H then a D two? Well, well, I don't, I don't understand your question. Are you talking about players, players one yes. strategies? Okay. One. What is your question again? Like as you get D H U. Uh huh. Like, uh, aren't we supposed to be like also by two, or is it have to be three? Well, what is three? Yeah, this is this is like my point. I always get confused. Like, now you have like a D and a U. Look, this is strategy for player one, okay? Mm -hmm. And here, D H U means what? It means the following the first guy is gonna play D here, H here and U here. This is what it says. Another strategy, DTU says, he's going to play D here, uh, and then uh, uh, T here, and then uh, U here. Okay? So, for example, this strategy, UHU, means the first guy is going to play U here, and so he's going to finish the game. But remember, strategy, by our definition, has to map each information set to an action. So although these decision nodes will never be reached because player one is finishing the game immediately at the beginning of the game, we nevertheless should specify what action he's gonna take at those decision nodes. So U, H, U means he's playing U here, but he's also playing H here and U here, all right? So once again, the strategy is mapping each decision node, player one has three, to an action. So because I have three decision nodes, the strategies for player one must be triplets. All right, should tell me what player one is gonna do in the first decision node, second decision node, and the third decision node. And because we have two actions available at each decision node, we must have two to the power three, which is eight strategies total, all right? Um, I mean, thank you for asking this. Uh, I mean, I know uh, uh, understanding this concept of strategy is, is not so straightforward. But guys, you have to clear this as quickly as you can because for the rest of this course, we will keep using this notion of strategy a lot. And it actually, the games will get even more complicated later. And so if you're not clear about the basics, like strategy, for example, you can't, I mean, if your foundation is not strong, you can't really build something stronger on top of it. All right, so you have to clear those foundational issues like strategy, for example, or expectations, uh, you know, as quickly as possible. So uh, thanks for asking. That's good because you're aware that you're, you're not clear about the concept of strategy but sort of spend extra time on understanding this strategy, all right? Go back to the previous examples and sort of revisit uh, how you wrote those strategies, compare with them with the solutions, okay? So that's very, very important practice. Yeah, because like why I ask, uh, since like two weeks ago, when we are doing the tree stuff, we basically going by like two. Mm -hmm. um, well, here, what two refers to? Like now, yes. I mean, in, in some games, players may have more than two decision nodes. So here, there are three decision nodes. What if player one had five decision nodes? Well, then that would mean strategy of player one would be uh, like five elements, all right? As many as the player's decision nodes or slash info sets. They're the same thing. Don't forget that. All right, so if a player has 100 decision nodes, well, then his strategy is going to be an, an, an animal that has 100 actions, all right? Uh, if he has 1,000 decision nodes, well, his strategy is going to have like 1,000 uh, sort of actions. 
Uh, that's what strategy is. Professor, is there like any way, like when I finish my business stuff, so I will know I'm doing right or wrong to check? Uh, no. Okay. This is not, unfortunately, like addition, so you can do sort of reverse engineering. Uh, yep, no. Okay, so let's continue. So here there are two subgame perfect Nash equilibrium strategy profile. Uh, I basically need to bring one strategy from player one, one strategy from player two, and create the strategy profile. All right? Uh, but the thing is, which one of those? So go back to the optimal strategies. Remember, the optimal strategy for player two is L and R. So both of them are optimal. So I'm going to underline both of them. But here, underlying has nothing to do with sort of Nash equilibrium kind of thing, all right? I'm not underlying any payoffs here. Uh, or if you like, put star, I don't care. Um, now, let's sort of uh, single out optimal strategies for player one. So optimal strategies for player one should always have H in the second component and D in the third component, all right? So for example, this cannot be optimal. Because it says player one is going to play T, not H. But I know T is not optimal for player one because it leads to zero payoff. So there is no equilibrium where player one ever plays T in, in, in the second decision node. So this is not optimal. Uh, what else? This is optimal because HD. TD is also not optimal, TD is also not optimal, HD, TU is also not optimal, and HU, HU are not optimal, because again, player one will never play U here. So you know what, there are two optimal strategies for player one, and two optimal strategies for player two, so therefore, that doesn't mean that two to the power two, four, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, be careful when you bring them together. So here, Remember, there are two SPNEs because the player one's optimal strategy, is it D or is it U, depends on what player two is going to play. So, if player two plays R, all right, I know that D is the optimal guy, not U. So, therefore, DHD is going to be the optimal strategy for player one. So, therefore, this is one SPNE. The second one, the second guy is playing left. In this case, U is optimal, which means UHD is going to be an equilibrium strategy. So therefore, UHDL is the uh, second subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So these are only two SPNEs in this game. Any question now? Here is one question. So these are two subgame perfect Nash equilibrium uh, strategy profiles of this game. And uh, one of your friends uh, suggests that because the second guy is indifferent between R and L, right, it really, it shouldn't matter whether uh, he plays L here right after DH, I mean, it's not right after, I'm sorry, sort of a DH, uh, DHD comma L and UHD comma, not L but R. So these should also be sort of equilibrium. Um, well, okay, this is good intuition. You can actually define a new equilibrium concept uh, with this property. And so uh, let's call this Arcadi equilibrium. Um, I mean, this is a legitimate way, right? We just define things. They're not God-given facts. And so this could be an equilibrium, fine. But the thing is, these are not subgame perfect Nash equilibrium by definition. Why so? Well, here is the reason. I mean, let's try to understand what, I mean, what is wrong with these. I don't know, by the way, if there's anything wrong with these, but let's try to see them. So it says the following. DHD. So the first player is going to play D and then H here and then D here, right? So these are sort of optimal strategies for player one. So let me put arrow on here, D. And it says the second player is going to be playing what? Um, L. Okay, very good. So what is going to be the payoff? So this is the strategy profile. What is going to be the payoff for player one? Uh, D, H, D, comma, L. Any answer? One, one. Exactly, because just follow the arrows, right? The, the path, so there's going to be a unique path. So, each strategy profile leads to a unique path 
and therefore unique uh, outcome. So here, if they play D, H, L, and L, so that means you have to follow the arrows and the arrows are gonna basically end up one, one payoff. That means player one is getting one payoff. Same for player two. All right, question is, can player one or two achieve something better? Player two clearly cannot because remember he was indifferent, she was indifferent between R and L. So that, that means she's gonna get exactly the same payoff, fine. But what about player one? Can player one achieve something better than this? Yes, by playing you. By playing you where? In the first simple set. Right? Very good. So, player one, so remember here, we are, yes, by backward induction finding SPNE, sort of a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, but don't forget, we still want our equilibrium to be Nash equilibrium. All right, so we are what we call refining our equilibrium. Uh, if you watch the videos, remember I said some games, some extensive form games are too many Nash equilibria, or some Nash equilibria have what we call uh, non-credible threats, which do not make any sense. They're so, sort of stupid strategy uh, profiles, and so we should get rid of them. But they are still Nash equilibrium. So therefore, we create a new equilibrium concept stronger than Nash, meaning it is still Nash, but stronger than that, which means we will eliminate some Nash equilibria to say, okay, the remaining ones are SPNE. But that doesn't mean that we would like to bring new solution, uh, sorry, new strategy profiles as equilibrium, because we still want our strategy profiles to be Nash equilibrium, meaning regret-free outcomes. Player one or two is gonna say, you know what? Uh, well, given your strategies, I actually did the best I could do. All right, so there's gonna be no regretting at the end of the game. Here, clearly in this case, there's a regret from player one because he's gonna say, you know what? You played left. If I knew this, I would certainly play you at the very beginning of the game and get two payoff rather than one. So therefore, this is not even a Nash equilibrium. Clear? Yeah, I understand. Uh uh, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I need to check, but probably if it is U, H, D, and R, all right, uh, so this time, this is what player two plays. Player one plays U, U, H, D, so basically it really doesn't matter, but player one's payoff is two. But if he knew that his opponent is playing R, he would actually go for D, right, and get the repayoff. So therefore, this is not even Nash equilibrium, and hence, it cannot be subgame perfect Nash.